Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Laurent. Um, I am in the Basel team, so and I work mostly on uh, on Skylark. So I will give some overview of um, what are the features in Skylark and um, what we are, we are going to to, uh, to do next. So the new features. So where we are? So Skylark is um, is designed to be just a simple language to extend uh, Bazel. <laughs> So the language is used in both build files and BZL files. Um, the, the, the syntax is a subset of, uh, of Python. So um, it should be familiar to most people. Uh, in, gen in general, the people like to, to, to read Python code and find it readable. And it's, it is a thread safe by design. So it, unlike many languages, um, so, so we have this feature by um, um, uh, whenever um, a data structure is shared, um, it gets frozen. It becomes immutable. This uh, enables us to evaluate a lot of code in parallel uh, in many different threads and to, uh, to, to reuse the results. When a BCL file is loaded first, we cache the result and we can reuse it many times because we know it will never change. It's schematic by design, so you cannot access um, things from the well, from the operating system, the, so for the files, network, and so on. And it's deterministic by design. So whenever you evaluate the code, it will always return the same, the same result. So this is guaranteed. And all these properties um, uh, are very important to us because we want reproducible builds. So whenever you, you build your, your code, you want to get the exact same result at the end. So with Bazel, uh, not everything is fully reproducible all the time uh, because of the ex execution phase, but at least um, in the evaluation phase, we, we have this guarantee. So we have build files. Build files are intended to be simple and descriptive. It's, it's a high-level uh, representation of your project. So what are the targets? What are the binaries? What are the libraries? What depend on what? So it's very high-level. And it's intended to be readable by both humans and tools. So normally, when you look at a build file, you have an idea of what's going on and how the project is structured. It's also important for tools, because we want tools to be able to read and understand the build file as well as the human. This is uh, super important to enable us to uh, create uh, tools on top of Bazel. And the, the build files should also be Writable by tools. Ideally, tools would take care of your build. Like um, there was a presentation yesterday about Gazel. You just run Gazel, it will generate your build file. You never have to look at it, and it just works. So it's not that great for every language, but that's the goal. So ideally, we should be able to generate build files automatically. Or if we have some ID integration in the future, IDs should be able to update the build files whenever you add a, a file in your project. And so build files are just the high level description. So just some example from Scala. Even if most of you haven't used the Scala, in Bazel you can understand what's going on because it's consistent with the rest of, um, of the rules. You could have Java library instead, it would just work the same. And in BGL files, we have the actual lo uh, logic. So BCL files describes the, the rules and the macros. And so it just, oh, yes, it just is the explanations, all the details of how the build file actually works. And so rules as a way to support new languages and new tools. And when I mean languages, so it's not just computer languages, uh, just like C++ or Java, but you can imagine lots of um, other tools. Like if you, if you want to, uh, to generate uh, um, a, a, a LaTeX document, you could just put your, your source file there and it will generate you know, the document. Or you could have some rules to, uh, to, uh, to, to, um, to create uh, data. Like if you have a video game and you want to generate some of the images in different sizes, or if you want to generate anything, it just, you can use rules for that. And, um, and so macros are just a lightweight mechanism to encapsulate existing rules. So normally, if you want to do anything complicated, don't use macros. So macros are just 
it's just convenient, but uh, just be careful because it doesn't scale well. And users are often tempted to create lots of macros to simplify their build files, but it, it's often more difficult to maintain the files after that. So ideally, you just keep your build files simple, and even if they are repetitive, it's fine, because you, uh, when you look at the build files, you can just instantly understand it. If you try to factor everything and remove every duplication, then the build files suddenly become more complicated to maintain by humans and especially by tools, because tools would have to evaluate your, your functions and see, understand everything. And so in general, just keep your build files simple and avoid too much abstraction. So yeah, just an example of macro. Um, yeah, in the documentation. So so rules work by, um, so, so here we have a, a simple uh, a build file. So just imagine that the library and binary have some sources and some other attributes. And so, so Bazel will um, generate um, an action graph. So this is the expansion of the CC library. It will run two, um, two commands uh, to, uh, to, uh, to call the C++ compiler. This will generate two .o files, and then it will link in a library that you can use. And when we evaluate the CC binary, um, so CC binary will also have some compilation step and uh, linking. But you notice um, the error between the two because the CC library sends information to the CC binary. It, it tells that um, it will generate a libutil.h, and so there, there's communication between the, the two. So for communication, you, you, we use providers. So, so the rules define an interface for the user. So here's the interface, it's just to say the rule has two attributes, sources and depths. The sources is just a list of .py files, and the depths are some targets that will provide a Python info provider. So this is really the, the interface uh, of the rule, well, what the, the, the rule accepts. And then once you have your interface, your, your rule can provide information to other rules, just like in the CC library example. So to provide information, we, we use a provider. Here we create a Python info and say that uh, every Python info has one field transitive sources. You could have more uh, attributes there. And you could also document them. So instead of the list, you could have a dictionary and, and each attribute has uh, some documentation associated to it. And in your implementation function, you, you just return the list of everything that your function provides. And once you have your interface and your providers, you can generate actions. So here is, um, in this example, we just uh, run a shell command. Um, yes, we are just uh, put on what you need here. But that's really what a rule has to do. It's communication with other rules and generating actions. And then uh, we can look at the rule performance. Um, so the idea is that uh, evaluating functions should be fast. Um, so oh, oh, typically in, a, in, a, in your dependency graph, you have many, many targets. Each target should be um, analyzed very fast and, and we analyze every the target in parallel. And to, uh, to keep the, um, um, the implementation function fast, um, the goal is to, um, also, so, so the function can, can look at the list of attributes and see what are the list of sources or what are the depend, dependencies, because that's the direct inputs. But it should not look at the uh, indirect or transitive inputs. Like, for example, if we have so, so some library that gathers uh, all the transitive uh, dependencies from all its dependencies, uh, you end up with a, a huge set of dependencies. And you don't want to iterate uh, over this set of dependencies because it would get slow. You don't want to expand it to a list. So, um, so the idea is that we have a, a data structure called depth set, which, which is optimized just for merging things together. It's just a uh, uh, one um, operation to merge uh, all the dependencies together, and you don't have to iterate over it. 
So use that set instead of list if you want to get the dependencies. And then you have um, also so, so there are other tips like um, we recently added um, so some uh, some functions to, to generate the command line. Um, so because uh, when you uh, you get all your dependencies in the dev set, you don't want to expand the dev set or you don't want to iterate over it in the analysis phase. But you still need to generate your command line. Um, and so if you use this uh, cjs.actions.args, it's just a lazy de data structure that will get expanded in the execution phase. So, uh, so, so you, you don't uh, expand the, the dev set during the analysis. Just only check the execution if you really need to execute this action. And yeah, if you care about performance, just use a uh, profiler. And so I've put a link here. I will just go through a few examples to, to profile uh, the code. So if you want these two co command lines, you will get some information about uh, the scalar code and uh, which functions uh, take time. Um, so here is just a summary to see if your build takes more time in the loading phase, analysis phase, or execution phase. So here you see that the loading phase is quite fast. So it's probably not uh, the part you want to optimize, but you might want to, to look at the analysis phase and obviously execution phase. And so if you generate, if you run this command, it will generate a, a huge HTML file which contains uh, some useful information. On top of that, we recently added um, uh, uh, other uh, commands. So here we use a startup flight um, macro. So uh, just look at the documentation to, to see how to see, uh, set, set up this. But basically, you can get the memory usage uh, of your build. So you analyze your targets, and then you see how much uh, memory yeah, it will, it's using. Of course, this number is useful, but you, you want more fine-grained information. So you can use um, this command with dump uh, dash dash rules, and you see the, um, how many rules um, uh, uh, are used in your build. So for example, you can see that there are 33,000 gen rules in this example. And you can also see the number of actions, because some, some rules generate one action, or many actions, or, or sometimes zero. So here you can see that Proto Library is generating a, a big number of, uh, of actions. And you can also um, uh, have um, more fine grade information. Um, so here it's uh, using a PPROF tool. And, and then you, you can see in which lines um, is, um, the targets are generated. So if some, something is using a lot of memory, you can just look at the BCL file and see uh, it's, which place it's called. Um, so I told you about the providers, and everything was great if you use only the scalar rules. Unfortunately, for historical reasons, we have lots of rules implemented uh, directly in Bazel. We call them the native rules. Um, and the native rules uh, don't always pro provide a good interface. Um, so, so, so the goal for, for, for native rules is to, um, only to, to uh, enable this uh, scenario. For example, you have a Java library and you want it to depend on a Scala library that you write. So instead of Scala library, you can imagine any JVM-based language. And then your Scala library should be able to depend on the Java library. So to implement this Scala library, you need to access the providers from the top library, and then you need to pass information to the bottom library. And so, so this works in Java, and there's a, a nice blog, blog post by Irina. Um, it will tell, tell you um, uh, how to uh, interact with uh, the Java rules. And the, the goal is, uh, is later to, uh, to enable the, the same for other languages. So it's not perfect everywhere, but we are working on it. On top of that, we, we have aspects. So I think Dimitri will tell more about it. Or or if you have any, 
Yeah. yeah. If you have an interesting question, just ask Dimitri. He loves to talk about it. <laughs> um, but the, the, the main idea is to be able to augment uh, the dependency graph with additional information, so uh, providers, or generate more actions. So if you have a dependency graph like this, um, so you have a, um, a target uh, X with multiple attributes. And so if you go through, if you, if you, if you work along, along the, the depths, you can generate a new graph by applying a function on every node uh, that is in the depths. Um, and so this is very useful to get some information about the graph. For, for example, to, um, to enable ID integration, you might want to work over the, the graph, get all the information about your, your build, and pass, uh, pass information to, to the ID. Or you can also de decide to, uh, to, to run some actions um, uh, in, in some in targets. And just a few things of uh, what we are doing or what we want to do. So there's a Skylib, which we open source recently. Um, it's just a collection of useful functions because we notice that many people need the same functions. So we should just put them uh, in a library. So here you can see some uh, functions with um, pass manipulation or quoting, um, uh, quoting some string for, uh, to pass it to, to a shell. So, so, yeah, so yeah, yeah, if you write complex rules, you, you probably want to take a look at Skylib. It's still very new. So please um, uh, ask for, 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 more, for more, more functions or, yes, just a send, send request. It's still quite small. Um, as you notice, we are doing a lot of changes in Bazel, and I know that some people complained about it yesterday. Um, so we, we added a flag um, uh, dash dash all incompatible changes. So the idea is that when we do some backward incompatible change, we first uh, put it behind the flag so that it's not enabled, but it allows you to, uh, to, uh, to try it. So if you build your code with uh, this flag, it will try with, with, with a new, with a few future changes. Um, and it will allow you to, uh, to make your code co compatible with, an, uh, with a future Bazel version. And then in the, in the future, we, we, swim, we swap the default, of, the default of the flags. So if you didn't update your code and you get a new Bazel version, you can still get the, the old behavior for some time until we definitely remove it. And so, yeah, uh, the, uh, the goal for, for us to, is to, to put all backward incompatible changes behind this, this flag. In practice, we don't always do, but we try. So just tell us if we um, if we don't do it correctly. We also want to provide more guidelines. Uh, we know that writing rules can be a bit complicated or confusing, uh, and so we we want to give you more information about it. So we have two style guides in the documentation. Um, this is something that we we want to improve and and extend. Um, so if you have any questions about the uh, style, just uh, ask us, um, probably on Stack Overflow on, uh, on the mailing list. And it, um, this feedback is very useful for us to, to impose the documentation. Um, there was a presentation yesterday about the linter. So this is um, some, something we recently uh, published. And, uh, and the goal is to add more, uh, more checks in the linter. And, for testing, we also want to publish more guidelines. Uh, we know that testing um, the scanner rules is not always easy or as good as, as you would like, but so we're going to, uh, to work on it and, and publish more guidelines. Um, there are lots of scanner rules. So if you check on GitHub with just this, uh, this search request, you, uh, you will find like 120 scanner rules. And it's, yes, and People uh, write uh, new scalar rules all the time, so it's uh, increasing quickly. Um, and so, ideally, we would provide a way to well um, to, to highlight uh, uh, which Bazel rules are uh, well written. Or um, also, so it's not uh, completely clear, but we we would like to yes, just to to uh, to, uh, to show which rules are we reliable, updated, maintained, and and comply with uh, with the guidelines. 
Um, some, uh, also, so, so when you, you modify the, the Scalar code, many people use a, a Python mode in the um, editor. But ideally, we would have better support for modifying a Scalar file. Um, and so uh, one solution to, to do that is to, to implement the language server protocol uh, from Microsoft. This is something that um, many IDs implement. So if you implement support for Scalark, it will um, it uh, it will be useful for, for many IDs. For, for example, uh, a Visual Studio Code and stuff like that. And so um, with the language server protocol, we can have uh, many ID features like um, code completion or go to definition uh, and all these kind of things and the tooltips and see the documentation and so on. So this is something that we would like to do, but we're not working on it yet. So if anyone is interested, just let me know. Um, for ID integration, we also want to have a debugger to get to, uh, to debug the, the scale code. So, so someone uh, made this prototype, and it, I think it look, uh, it already looks really great. Um, so if you so you have the scan code on the, on the right, and you can put breakpoint uh, on your code, and um, uh, and then you, you can see the, the, the list of all the local variables or all the definitions and and explain everything. So here you have a depth set, and you can see every element in the depth set. Um, so this is something that, that is not published yet. It's a work in progress. Um, it should be available soon. Um, and so this is integration in uh, VS Code. Uh, ideally, we would use the, the same protocol to, to add support in other uh, ideas. And yeah, there are more potential tools that uh, we would like to have. But for example, build file generation. Um, so uh, there was a talk about Gazel yesterday. So ideally, we would have this kind of tool for every language or everything uh, you want. Just tools that, that will update and maintain your build files so that you never have to look at them again. And well, so, so, so it's a bit related, but um, it would be nice also to have a strict dependency for all languages. So someone uh, mentioned yesterday that users uh, will uh, always add uh, the dependencies when they when they need them because otherwise it doesn't build. But they always forget to remove them because well it still builds, so they, they don't. It's it can be difficult to know which dependencies are not used when you just look at, at the build file. So ideally that's that's um, that's a job for, for for tools to detect what what is needed and what is not. And if you remove all the unneeded dependencies, it can speed up your build uh, a lot. We, I mentioned yesterday, buildifier that formats uh, the build files. Ideally, we would have the same for BTL files. You just type your, your code, you, uh, you, you run the tool, it will form, format it nicely, and you don't have to care about indentation or spaces or this kind of things. And once you have this code formatter, you can build a lot of refactoring tools on top of it. Just like I mentioned builder yesterday for build files, you could imagine uh, refactoring tools for BTL files. So if you rename a function or this kind of thing. And yesterday, someone told me that they would like to have some kind of type checking for Scala code. I think that's something that could be potentially integrated um, in the linter. So we're not going to have static typing. But in some cases, you just can um, analyze the, the code. And when you have type information, you can propagate it and see if there's um, a type error. So it will never catch everything, but maybe it's, it can be good enough uh, to be useful for users. And so, yes, yeah, so, so, uh, so I think the, the goal is to build um, uh, an ecosystem on Bazel. So for the Scala team, there are really two goals. First is to enable, uh, enable you write high quality rules for every language you care about. And the second part is high quality tools. So we want tools to manipulate the, the build files. We want tools to analyze uh, the build graph. For example, you can use a Bazel query to have some information about the graph. Or you can use um, uh, aspects to get uh, also some information about the graph. And, you, and 
since uh, we provide you a lot of information, you can easily build tools on, uh, on top of that that will analyze uh, the graph and maybe suggest some transformation in the build files. Like this target should be split because uh, it depends on, on a lot of things and it will make the, the build faster. Or there are lots of things that we, which you can do once you have access to the build graph. We also want to enforce conventions. And I think that's something you, uh, very important when you have a large code, code base. Um, if you have conventions for every language, it makes everything much simpler. So, so yeah, the goal is to make your code base scale. So yeah, that's really the two um, important things for, for the Scala team. Enable you to write good rules and enables you to write good tools. Thank you.